Um, I think the crux of the situation at hand is money. No smart person that already has money is going to sink their money into something that, quite frankly, up front does not immediately make money. It takes a little bit of crazy, just the right amount, just enough to make you interesting well, or a little that's, idealistic. That's, I mean, that's why us working class people are providing for it. Right. <laughs> like, I mean, what, like, what you're doing isn't, um, isn't an immediate return, right? Like, like the shows no. you put on, I mean, it's m- much more about building a network and stuff. And hopefully, you know, you're starting to see some momentum build with that. Um, we haven't talked much about that, but yeah, uh, that I don't know if we should get into that on this podcast, but like how the whole engine works is, uh, pretty deep um but i think if if more business owners like what we talked about before and i'll get to it in a second if more business owners took risks on having a band play in their bar as opposed to just putting a jukebox there right you know you'd be doing something different you know uh here's one i know we can all almost relate to because i know you haven't really played out as much you know um the battle of ticket sales. That's right, ladies and gents. I'm talking about pay to play. <laughs> In case you guys do not know what pay to play is, the venue or promoter gives you a batch of tickets. You know, it could be like 50 tickets, $10 a ticket. You keep $3 out of every ticket, but typically the tickets are $10 ish. And you have to come back to that promoter with at least half of that money, if not all of it, or else you either don't play or you get a very, very bad set time. A lot of people may ask, why is that? That's because the venue does not have a guarantee that you can pull people. But now it's very paradoxical. If we're all hanging out in the back of a truck, right, and this is our first time playing out downtown somewhere or in a different city, how are we supposed to get people there in the first place? It's very paradoxical, you know. This is why these scenes, in my opinion, need to be created. Because if you just throw two or three house parties in something that's free, like a barn, workshop, basement. People just, they don't have to risk anything. It's BYOB. Okay, cool, then they get turned on to the band. You know, after doing that for a period of time, then, you know, hit up a venue, let the venue know. Next thing you know, you don't have to beg and kill over selling tickets, it just, it works itself. So, I, I see why venues do pay to play, but I think, once again, it still comes down to the musician if you were creative enough to really like just try to try to fight the system the best way you can you know it could still work out that way have you guys ever had to do pay to play no um but i mean i for the right venue i'd probably do it um right right. but i don't that's that's how most bands think though once again it's like the desperation we too want to play at place x because it's place x but the fact is, unless you're opening for somebody that can actually pull people to place X, you know, right? we probably can't do it, which is weird. Yeah, it's an unfortunate system. But like you said, I mean, you do understand the plight of the business owner who's trying to move alcohol, make, you know, make a living. Right, right. And, and I get that, too. So I think it's just up to, you know, the individuals to take risks. You know, if you own a bar, take risks every now and again. You know, if a band maybe says, hey, we can only get 10 people here, maybe let them you know play anyway because i'm not familiar with how big the amounts usually are yeah i think you said as high as like 20 to 40 tickets or something yeah typically if it's a place i'm gonna try my best to not target any venues in particular but um yeah it's typically like a batch of 20 20 40 or 50 tickets if it's those bigger like just event halls it's gonna be 50 tickets it's gonna be a minimum of 10 dollars per ticket And they could give a rat's ass if you actually sell them all or if you buy them all. There are a lot of bands that do that, not only here. This isn't just a Cleveland thing. It happens, like, across the country, like, the pay-to-play thing because, you know, the venues need to make money. And you know what's crazy, too, is, like, what musical acts (laughs) actually pull this amount of people in the shortest amount of time? I'm talking about turnover rates here. Like, more technology-based music, so rap, you know, EDM stuff. In terms of logistics, it's a lot easier to get a few DJs going through one mixer. Right. And then just collect the tickets, that's fine. You don't have three or four different drum sets, you know. You don't have massive vans 
everywhere. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's it's still pretty rowdy because now what they're looking at their issues that they have with that is like uh, crowd control, drugs, a lot of violence with that. You know, which could be said for early punk. You know, sure. As well. Absolutely. Yeah. Those and those guys were crazy. Punk. And modern punk. And modern yeah. punk. And modern for that punk matter. Too. Good yeah. point. <laughs> exactly. So you almost got to pick your poise in there. You know. Right. I totally. Totally feel that. I might have just talked to myself for the past. Five <laughs> minutes, and I'm sorry. No, every every type of uh, fan can get rowdy, you know, yeah. or has their rowdy people mm-hmm. within them. And like you said, especially like early punk. I mean, I can understand people who didn't wouldn't want to have that those types of shows if they just weren't energetic enough to deal with it because i mean some of those shows i mean i mean the, the level of violence was just a little over the top even for me i think right right <laughs> even though i like that music you know right. i don't like black flag but going to a, one of those early black flag shows would have been a little right <laughs> i think i think a good topic Thanks. to talk about too is uh crowd control uh would you say that the music that subtle q produces is aggressive I, I sure hope so yeah i'd say it's aggressive aggressive pop really yeah aggressive pop <laughs> mosh pits uh, maybe at times maybe not all the time I, I try not to be a plateau I like yeah. I like music that has valleys and peaks very cool yeah. very cool is there any one thing that you think a musical act should not do in a venue especially a non-DIY space um, I mean I guess the obvious things like disrespect their equipment disrespect the people there who are trying to help you maybe um those are really the main things i think um the, the, i think yeah just don't don't disrespect people who are helping you out because you you know that's part of what building a scene is true and if you are so disrespectful i mean i have no proof of this at all i've just read about it online but the the venues are their own cliques of crews too it's just at a different level, you right. know? So, like, if there are groups of guys that hang out and you have, like, kickbacks or, like, fires at your house, one dude starts a fight, and he starts a fight the next weekend, we're going to tell everybody, like, hey, let's not have X person here. Right. It's dumb. So, it's like you'll get blacklisted if you trash a certain venue or act a certain way, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of bands, regardless of what they're playing, <laughs> trap music, punk, metal, like, the golden rule, like treat others the way you want to be treated, man. Or like, if you right. if you at least like tell the promoter, or, like the venue owner, like, hey, we brought our own mics and our own stands. We plan to break everything. <laughs> we'll keep it on the stage, but we plan to break everything. Even if you at least told them that, like, if not on your rider when you get there, like a good hour before the show, they're gonna be. <laughs> That stress will be totally gone because the second they see they see that crap going down, dude, like that's your head. Like you, you sure. Good luck attempting to come back there, you know. Right. Um, which also brings me to another interesting uh, sort of groove here. At what point do you think a performer is uh, has a good stage presence versus just acting stupid and belligerent? At what point is it? Does it stop from being a performance art? I think um, when you pair intensity and honesty, right? So, like, I think when you're if you're being intense and it's obviously affected, you know, sometimes that can be good. But like you said, a lot of times it just comes up as over the top or belligerent. Um, but if you can be intense in a way that feels real, that feels honest, like you're trying to c- express something that you've really felt or something that other people feel, right? Then I think that's where the sweet spot is. What artists would you use as an example of that? Um, so I grew up as a Nirvana fanboy. So I, th- I think Kurt Cobain was a pretty amazing like singer and performer. Um, shoot, a lot of them. I mean, anything from a lot of people who aren't even gr- that great of singers, like uh, Jeff Mangum of Neutral Milk Hotel, hmm. just have amazing expression and um, amazing amount of like uh, soul in the way that they sing. I'd, I'd say he's he's another one that uh, sticks out. Hmm. Um, you know anyone anyone from shoot like nina simone right like nina i can simone. like the, just random singers that come come off the top of my head um i see what 
I'm sorry I keep going back into business, but I just feel this is such a major problem, and it's like, honestly, without money, that's like 90 to 9, probably 95% of the reason why a lot of musicians are perceived of as like trashy people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, not good people you want to hang around. Like, the evil blues men, you know what I mean? Or right. it's like, don't date a rapper because he probably sells drugs. You know, like, <laughs> hey, you know, like, that's probably not good. What occupations do you think are good for musicians to have? Uh, and trades. Why? And we were talking about that a couple of days ago, yeah, right? Yeah, Definitely yeah, yeah. look into the, if you're not, um, if you're not genuinely passionate about a subject that you're going to college for, you probably shouldn't be going to college, right? Um, so definitely look into the trades if you just need something to make money. You know, learn skills, become a more complete person. You know, learn learn how to wire, yeah. you know, things. Learn how to uh, repair things. The life skills, right? Right, because the, you know that those that can mean jobs. It can mean lower costs of living when you're able to repair your own stuff instead of paying someone to do it. Exactly. Or buying a new thing. Right. 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 Um, I'd say th things like that. I mean, I've got a buddy who um, plays in the band called what Sle Clean Slate Club now. He's a welder, right? He right. makes makes a good living and uh, is able to uh, do his music too. I think with the right. trades too, because most musicians love to travel. The great thing about the trades is a lot of the time, you once you just finish a project, you're good. Right. Unless you like really joined a union, but like if you were seriously like had your own shop or if you were say like a carpenter and you helped build two houses and you tell your foreman like, Hey, I'm going to move two states away once you finish this second house. I'll be right. with you guys till the end. But the second that last nail is in there, I'm going. As long as you hold up your end of the bargain and you're not being stupid, people are fine with that. Because it happens mm -hmm. all the time. You know, I think uh it's a very old school way of looking at it. And, like, times are totally changing, you know? Right. It doesn't necessarily have to – well, I, I guess you could call certain IT fields still definitely a trade because a lot of people now, you mm -hmm. know, the whole, like, van life craze, you know? A lot of the people that just surf every day are technically, like, self-taught IT security people that just love to surf. Right. Yeah, dude. What's up? It's like, yeah, dude, that's a smart idea. Like, Hell yeah, because landlords suck and, like – the waves are breaking so let's go like right that's the other side of the coin that's right the other side is, yeah the, the modern hippie gypsy side right stuff. Yeah. lower your cost of living find ways to cut costs you don't need everything that modern society tells you you need exactly that's the other side right the other side is have a good skill that can make you a living you know and then you got cut costs there's so there's a tiny house movement You've exactly seen those. i love those they're awesome yeah 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 or like upcycling things and then um i could see how on the outside to a person that just works and grinds in like a cubicle farm, like for a nine to five, they can still perceive a musician as kind of trashy, I guess. Cause it's like, even if you are leaving, living a relatively clean lifestyle, doing yoga, just, uh, being a freelance person basically. And you just happen to play music. They're just like, Oh, you live in a van by the river. <laughs> you skate. You're like 26. Who skates? It's Someone like, who loves it. Yeah, it's like, bro, you're 24, okay, and you don't like your fiance. You're getting hammered all the time. And you can't pay your car note. Right. Look at your quality of life versus my quality of life. You know what I mean? So it's like you got to always put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. I think smaller bands, too, should realize that even even if they play at venues or not, they're going to be – there's always – no matter what you're doing, music or otherwise, there's always going to be somebody that's better than you. You just have to – be okay with that, you know? Oh, sure. Sometimes you honestly, like, quite actually will not, like, get to that level, but there's nothing to stop you from trying to get to that level. And uh, totally ask questions, you know? Don't just yeah. be pissed off at this band because <laughs> you got stiffed and you had to play at 545 and now they're playing at 1130 for the same show and they mm -hmm. came in a beautiful RV. You don't know who actually owns that RV. You know, they could be signed. All of those guys could be welders, you know, be barbers. Sure. You know, there could be a surgeon there. Just because they have all this flashy stuff does not necessarily automatically mean that their life is good and that their life is better than yours and that their stuff is solid. Right. It's just a vehicle, you know, just right. because they have a brand new Vox or whatever. It's literally just an amp, you know. 
you don't go to your first day of college, right, to look for designer pencils. You don't care. You're more pissed right. off that you had to buy a book that was $75 that you found out you're not going to use that day. <laughs> Such a scam. Right? That's that's, a tangent, that's, but... that's pretty aggravating, right? So why would you look at a, a show or somebody else like the same way, you know? You got to, like, bring it back, I suppose, and, like, hone it in. Um, where at, – at this stage of your band, I suppose, what – do you guys normally use to record and what do you hope to use to record? Uh, do you, do you want to go through third party people? And, um, yeah, like how on, on the tech side, how do you guys approach recording? Right. Do you guys have like lyrics written out and then you guys sit there and like try to paste them all together or like, how does that work? Um, okay. So starting with the recording, um, I have a little, uh, an old, uh, Mac desktop, that we use, you know, I have uh, a few DAWs in there, and we've used everything from uh, GarageBand to uh, Reaper, which is my current favorite. Cool, cool. Right. This podcast is recorded in Reaper. Yeah, great program. You should yeah. check it out. They, they've got a really cool uh, business model anyway. Yes. Um, as far as um, lyrics, um, I tend to uh, brainstorm a few times for each song and then try to, like, write out a final copy in sort of a master notebook. And then I, I don't usually need to read from it by then. I, you can usually remember it, but that's not foolproof. <laughs> so I uh, totally understand that. Sometimes I will have to go look it up. Right. Very cool. Um, Chapman, John Chapman. Mm -hmm. Does he write any songs, even though he's on drums? Uh, he definitely uh, writes his own music. Um, we haven't had any songs that started with an idea by him yet just because i brought a lot more material into the band but he's also he's had he definitely has input into some of the songs um that are in our set now as far as like structure or adding in beats or ideas or even you know, like new sections of the song so he has input that way and um some of the new batch of songs were things that um we started as jams between us um or things that he came to the table with for Bands at any level, do you think creative differences spur over seriously being creative or over one person starting apart? <sighs> or money being sprinkled on top of it? <laughs> it's like, okay, I'll find out you're getting this amount of royalties. I really don't like this now. You know, right. Like, what do you, how do you assess that? I think both uh, strategies can work. And sometimes it's definitely easier to just have one person be, be sort of the uh, idea starter, even if it's a different person for each song. Right, someone brings something to the table, and they have a general vision for how they want to go, and then maybe you iron it out in the moment. Yeah, but that, in my experience, that leads to um, ego problems a lot of times. Really? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. It's just it's a lot less fun to work on someone else's music than it is to work on your own music. If you if you're someone who writes music, that's mm -hmm. at least my experience. Maybe I'm narcissistic, but uh, um, I've definitely had the people I play with ex express that too. You know, they'd rather sometimes work on their songs than work on another song by me. You know, or another song that I started. Mm -hmm. So that does come into play too. It's it's always more fun to come up with ideas as a group, but it's harder, right? It's more, um, like you said, there's there's more creative differences that you have to work out. You never have to really um, struggle against yourself. I, I guess you do, but I don't know what I'm saying. It's there. like in a different, yeah, I got it. It's in a different way. There's yeah. no no personality conflicts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Have have you guys tried to or thought about playing out of state before? We haven't. We definitely would like to. I just, that's I just the goal. That's absolutely the goal. Yeah, because I know you guys are definitely trying to tour. Uh, what states? What cities? Where? Where? Um, we'd probably start just in the area around Cleveland, just because that's mm -hmm. where we live. So you know, I want to play Pittsburgh. Um, I've been to maybe one show there, so I don't actually know if the if there's many places to play, but. Jonas is telling me absolutely. Oh yeah, <laughs> dude. Oh, the whole Philly DIY scene. That's a place that's like a legit. Oh well, hello. Well, hold on, Jonas. Yeah, Pittsburgh is the spot, dude. There's so many venues. It's Sweet. like if Cleveland wasn't so rusty and like falling apart, it'd be <laughs> Pittsburgh. Okay. It's yeah, Pittsburgh is a little further along that like revitalization yeah, timeline, like, right? <laughs> it's like growing again and like becoming something new, kind of. Mm -hmm. Not like gentrifying, it's like just be like growing. Right. Also, I have kind of a, like a question for both of you dudes since you both played shows. Do you prefer like going to shows or playing them? You want, 
you want to answer that first? I, I have an answer, but it depends on who I'm seeing. Purely on who I'm seeing. Oh, that's a good point. Not the place that I'm playing. Okay, so like a, like a good ass show or like playing a good ass show. You know what I mean? So playing or performing a good ass show. And the show is just a show, like no backstage passes or anything. Yeah, just like going to a show. Just so going to it. Show. I see. Yeah, I would probably still pick performing then. Like, because like there was a point where like Death Grips came out of retirement and like came to Cleveland. I was like, holy shit. But that was also at the same time where like my band played our first show like on Halloween last year. Well, under this new pretense name thing. And like that, that was like eye-opening as hell and that was in the basement of a rental house so it was like you know go to x venue around a thousand people end up fighting some people maybe see mc ride but hear my favorite jams through a real sound system or you know hang out with my friends doing what i kind of want to do slightly more control over the situation you know so i I would pick performing for right now at least performing over it even though it's way more stressful but (coughs) yeah Definitely performing when it goes well, yeah. Because I was gonna say, if it doesn't go well, if you're unhappy with how you performed, then I'd, I'd say I definitely like being a spectator better. It's yeah, easier, less yeah. pressure. <laughs> I'm thinking like best case scenario for both of them, um, and I think that's something too to remember as somebody getting hip to the whole sequence. There's always gonna be bullshit in your life at the show, in the oh, car yeah. rides to and from the show. <laughs> okay, a lot of people forget about that. Those car rides, they get tense. Okay, because it's either going to be really funny in a great time or it's going to be dead silent until somebody brings up that one thing (laughs) and it's going to be bad. You know what I'm talking about, dude. Like, I'm not not fucking around. Like, it's it's wild, man. So, like, don't automatically assume that every show is going to be great. Don't automatically assume that every show is going to be garbage. Practice like you perform. I learned that from marching band. And so it's like, worst case scenario, a fight breaks out in the back of the venue, and you guys finish the song. Even if somebody's guitar breaks midway through the song, you keep playing through the song. Right. Keep going. Do not stop playing the fucking song. Okay? Because then it really looks unprofessional and just not good at all. Oh, yeah. You want to, like, if you guys typically move around when you play, you know, definitely play like that. I made the terrible mistake of doing that and like smoking way too many cigarettes when I was living in a different place. And like, uh, yeah, we, we would rehearse one day and we're all sitting down like in the amps, like in the basement. And then we'd go to a house show and I'm really hyped. Cause there's like a hundred people crammed in there and it's all hot and sweaty. I want to like run around. I'm just <laughs> can't finish yep. one line. Like I can't even say like, what's up everyone. You know, it's like, damn, like, this is way more cardio than I thought, you know. But once again, this isn't just for music. This, like, goes for skating. Like, I was telling you, like, anybody that sees my vape, I'm at 0% nicotine right now, which is fantastic. Nice. Congrats. You used to be two packs of American Spirits. Like, yeah, this should, it was wild. So it's like uh, Jonas and I skateboard a lot, too. So it's like a lot of dudes that skate are also very unhealthy, you know. And then you wonder why X people are perceived of as scumbags. But then you have this weird subgenre of skaters now that learn through YouTube and they're like health freaks <laughs> that are very into yoga. But that's totally cool because like the more you actually are healthy, it was like, wow, this is a lot easier to do. <laughs> like, right. Who would have known that not smoking cigarettes? I could actually be in a band. You know, I could actually <laughs> skate. So that's just some fruit for thought, though. Like practice like you perform and genuinely at least attempt to be healthy. Sit there and practice vocal exercises as well. Saves you money, too. Yes, which we, which we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Okay, so like as far as stage presence goes, Avery, like what is that to you? Like, What is good stage presence? To me, good stage presence, you don't necessarily have to uh, like dance around the stage. You don't have to be burning up guitars and stuff. Make eye contact with the crowd. Like, mm. Actually make eye contact with the crowd. Get very good at playing and not looking down. That's, I will tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Like, yeah, because that was another good method that I learned from marching band. Once again, it's it's a very real thing. If you've been around musicians long enough that can hold a conversation while playing, it's like, oh, God, okay, this person knows what they're doing, you know. 
and once again, that's very good too. You learn how to multitask because once again, it's not if it's totally a matter of when shit hits the fan. You know, right? If you see a fight breaking out, and I'm looking over at Jonas, and I just kind of lean over, or like if I tap my head, it's like we're gonna go back up to the top of this song, and we're just gonna loop it until that fight is over. Because if we stop the song right now, once again, it's crowd control. Like this whole place is gonna get fucked up. So we're just gonna right. keep playing. Might even jam. You know, come up with hand signals for people in your band. You right. know, understand stuff like that. You know. Uh, but stage presence, totally looking the person in the eye, get so comfortable with your instrument that it is second nature. When you go to pick mm-hmm. something up off of the desk, like I can look straight at Aiden and know where my phone is, right? Yeah. You don't look down every time you go up and down stairs. You just do it. That's as comfortable as you need to be to be at that touring level. It's true. Honestly, that's that's what I'm talking about. And then from there, then you can start to spice it up. So like – for a while there, I played with a wireless guitar. So it's like, I could totally walk into the crowd and play. Like, actually play the part. Not just mm-hmm. fuck around with it. Like, actually sit there and play the part. And get distracted. And just do stupid stuff. And people are just like, whoa. Wow. that that It just sells the whole thing. Now, for drummers, this is very difficult to do. Because, of course, you're kind of locked into one spot. Still make um, facial cues at people. Have a few rehearsals set aside for you to try challenging things, whether it's flashy stick flipping or playing choppy parts that you don't normally play, but section out time with the whole band so everybody knows, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you guys see that it's an exciting moment, it's like, oh, guys, we thought we were going to have 50 people. We actually have 100 people. It's like, all right. Like, think of it seriously, almost like a sport. It's like, okay, we'll we'll do play number two, like the hyped one. We're like, if shit hits the fan, at least we had fun. So it's like, at this point, you know, Jonas is going to solo while Sebastian's going to try a solo that he's never done before at the same time, you know. I'm going to start I'm gonna start a mosh pit, you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> I'm going to take off my guitar while they're trying some experimental shit, you know. And we've already tested it, like, at the warehouse, you know. Like, right. You're used to playing the few bars, you know. Totally get prepared for that sort of thing. But yeah. first steps, practice, 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 practice. I'm not talking about the game. I'm talking about practice. (laughs) Practice. (laughs) Need to practice, dude. Because there is nothing worse, and there's nothing that will still piss off other bands than seeing a band that's not camera. Camera. There's still... um, There we go. There's still nothing worse than seeing a a band or a musician play live, and you're supposed to open for this person, and they don't know what they're doing. (laughs) Uh, Which brings me to the last topic. We're at 54 minutes here doing pretty well um drugs <laughs> drugs and alcohol in stage presence oh my yes drugs alcohol stage presence oh my oh no <laughs> oh no <laughs> um now for those of us that have not practiced as much we may lack certain confidence and that might be seen as liquid courage right i think as bands start off to like if you do I don't I personally don't drink at all. I have never had a beer in my life. Bullshit. Yeah. I'll, we'll talk about it later. Don't really later. think you're missing much, but I do drink. But uh yeah, it's it's uh Yeah, no, isn't that weird? I'm twenty three. Yeah, it's really weird. But I have my reasons. Anyway, uh yeah, so when you see someone that doesn't know what they're doing and they're not that comfortable, especially in your band, downing mm-hmm. two or three beers, that's a red flag right there that you guys need to have a talk. Obviously, you probably can't have that talk right there before the show, but you guys need to have a talk. Because if that is their coping mechanism for getting through the show, you guys need to figure something out because that will screw stuff up in the long run. Um, temptation control with that. Uh, not only with the alcohol or drugs, but with personal relationships. If you have a lead singer in a band and it's a female or a woman, I'm sorry, I sound stupid. If you have a woman that's your front woman in your band, right, and you know that she's married and you guys are on the road and then you see her flirting with a few other guys, it's like, what are you doing? Right. You have a kid. You know what I mean? Like, this is not a good idea. You know, if your husband did this, would would you be okay with it? Well, no, he's just a promoter of this other place. It was like, okay. 
but that's still pretty sketchy, you know. And right. dudes are known, men are known for doing stupid stuff. I'm not even going to get into that, but men are known for being really sedated and then getting in trouble with women, you know, because, well, man, there were a thousand people never played in front of a thousand people before, <laughs> so, you know, just took two shots, and then, yeah, and then right. I woke up in a hotel room. Like, you motherfucker, you took two shots, and you woke up two cities away? Way more than two shots, dude. Um, but, yeah, how do you... How do you view that Sub- substances and live performance? Um, well, I definitely think it's something that you need to talk about, right? I mean, I, I don't think I think, I think you certain talk about people. It before you even right. Oh, exactly. Yeah, talk about it during rehearsal, yeah. right? And I think there's some people who can drink, you know, two beers, three beers before a show and play fine. But like you said, it it should be something that maybe they're used to doing. They might maybe even do it during rehearsal, and you've heard them play it. Yeah. like that and and you talked about it and you know it's coming and it's not nerves you know motivating them to do it like you said right and they're not downing them they're just maybe enjoying them because they happen to enjoy that vice right um it was like I, me with the cigarettes it was like that is just something it was like me with the cigarettes it was like that's just something that we do you right. know it's like i get a hot, half a pot of coffee put on my slippers make sure i got my smokes from the corner store by that time, my dudes pull up, we unload the van, and we just chill. Right. You know, because it's like, it's a good time. And then I did, once again, I didn't notice it was a problem until I was standing up, trying to fucking mm-hmm. get around. I was like, oh, no. Oh, God, I'm going to have a heart <laughs> attack. I'm going to actually have a fucking heart attack. <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's about moderation. Just like mm-hmm. the, the self-control to know where you should stop and be able to do stuff to like be fine under the influence of whatever. Like it's all about just knowing what you can and can't handle and still perform and do what you have to do. Right. Yeah, and being being honest with each other and I, I think again, like sticking to your word, right? Like again, if I if two if two to three beers starts becoming five to six to seven to eight, then they you know, that's where the real problem lies. Right. 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 So that moderation is really the right the greatest thing. I mean Exactly. Even if you everyone has vices, just you know, maybe don't smoke you know, however many cigarettes you smoke yeah that day yeah or whatever. it was like, like i said it was it was pushing like two packs a day <laughs> of very strong cigarettes yeah and then like when i was running out of money it was like it it went to like <laughs> it was like it had money two packs of american spirits one pack of american spirits marlboro black 100s and then like the more i started working on my van i started mm-hmm. smoking like a dude that works on cars <laughs> it was like winston winston reds <laughs> And I was running out of shit so quick. I was like trying to sc- scrape money together. I was like, we'll get some lucky strikes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then it's like, I can't pay for rent anymore. Oh shit. It's time yep. for Newports. <laughs> and then it just went down, oh, no. dude. It just went- I live like on the border of Kentucky and over there. I was like, I got to the point where I was like asking my friend, I was like, I gotta roll my own, man. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? I was like, yeah, dude. Because like, like I said, I don't do anything. I don't smoke pot. Like that was it. That's right. literally it. So like all of this shit, working eighty five hours a week, that was the only vice, and it was yeah. kicking my ass. So it was just like, oh no, oh no. And then when all the money was gone, it was really stupid. It was like, okay, well, there's an ashtray over there outside the venue. I'm gonna go through the ashtray like a bum. Right. And we're here trying to not look retarded, cut that shit off with my pocket knife. And they're like, dude, you you good, bro? I was like, dude, it's a show ritual, man. I got to have at least three cigarettes before we play. He's like, damn. Before you play? I was like, yeah. He's like, well, you got like one and a half right there. I was like, no, I already killed one on the way out. He's like, you sure? I was like, yeah, I'm cool. So, yeah, you got you to gotta, uh, know thyself. Right. And uh, if you're serious about being in a full-time band, I think another thing, too, would be uh, – Make sure that these are people that you are totally okay with, like genuinely okay with, because you're going to be around each other for a long time, the best right. of times and the worst of times. Uh, are there any closing statements you would like to make, Sir Aiden? Um, just the normal ingratiating one. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Um, and everyone go check out Subtle Q on all the social media websites and all that. Right on. Thank you guys for watching another dope podcast, you know, hanging with the dudes, my dude. Today we had Jonas as our co-producer. Aiden's over there in the back. Hopefully we'll see you guys on the other side. Have a good day. You've watched the Pleasant Podcast. Aloha.